By the end of the Second World War, Nazi Germany found itself on the brink of defeat, experiencing the most difficult period in its history. The country was fractured. Some citizens sank into apathy. Others felt a surge of patriotic sentiment. And still others tried to analyze the causes of failure. In this chaotic state, the state continued to pour vast resources into the development of revolutionary technologies that could change the course of the war. These developments became known as Wunderwaffe, the wonder weapon, a broad range of military projects aimed to create ultra-powerful armaments that could secure an advantage in the final months of the conflict. Among these technologies, a special place was held by the rocket program, which would later become the foundation for post-war space exploration. German scientists achieved such a level of innovation that their work inspired amazement, respect, and even fear among the Allies. Many of Germany's captured technologies were used by leading nations for decades after the war, a testament to their uniqueness and effectiveness. The type Weipin submarine became one of the most striking examples of Wunderwaffe, the pinnacle of engineering thought at the time. This vessel represented an attempt to radically change approaches to submarine warfare, going far beyond traditional solutions. To understand the significance of these boats, it is necessary to return to the historical context. In 1945, Germany was in its death throes. The Allies were advancing from all directions, and the German Navy, particularly its submarine fleet, was suffering enormous losses. The crisis engulfing the naval forces was clear. Old methods of waging war had lost their effectiveness. It was in this critical period that the idea emerged to create an entirely new type of submarine, capable of operating far more efficiently than its predecessors. The type of Missiwaint submarines were the answer to this urgent need and their impact on history proved so great that even decades later, they remained a model to be emulated. In 1942, the German submarine fleet, known as the Kriegsmarine, faced a serious crisis. The wolf pack tactics, which had brought significant success early in the war, began to lose their effectiveness. This method involved coordinated attacks by groups of submarines on allied convoys, but over time, the allies developed new countermeasures. With improvements in radar and anti-submarine technologies, the British and their allies began detecting and destroying German submarines with unprecedented efficiency. Submarines such as the popular Type 7 and Type 9 models were forced to operate mostly on the surface to keep up with fast convoys. This made them easy targets for aircraft and escort ships equipped with modern detection systems. The problem lay in the very nature of submarines at the time. They were more diving vessels, spending most of their time on the surface, rather than true underwater ships. Type 7 boats, the main workhorses of the Kriegsmarine, had an underwater speed of only 7 knots and could remain submerged for a maximum of 45-50 minutes at top speed. After that, the batteries were completely drained, forcing the vessel to surface to recharge its diesel engines. By 1942, such tactics had become deadly as the Allies were equipping their ships and aircraft with radar in large numbers, allowing them to detect surface submarines even at night or in poor weather. In addition, these submarines had limited endurance. The Type 7 boats had a submerged displacement of 860 tons and were armed with four bow and one stern torpedo tubes, as well as an 88 millimeter deck gun. They proved effective early in the war, when Allied anti-submarine defenses were still underdeveloped. However, by the middle of the war, their inability to remain submerged for long periods and their low underwater speed had rendered them obsolete. The Type 9 boats, designed for long-range patrols, had greater endurance but lacked significant design differences that could decisively change the situation. This crisis demanded an immediate solution. German designers realized that to continue fighting effectively, they needed a fundamentally new type of submarine, a true underwater vessel capable of operating mainly below the surface, attacking from depth and evading pursuit. The main obstacle was the lack of a powerful propulsion system that could operate independently of atmospheric air. Initially, the idea of developing a gas turbine engine was considered but progress on such technologies was too slow for wartime conditions. 
Therefore, it was decided to focus on a diesel electric system that could provide high underwater speed and long submerged endurance. It was at this moment that the idea of the Type von Eupin submarine was born. Grand Admiral Karl Donitz, himself an experienced submariner since the First World War, understood the need to transition from diving vessels to true underwater ships. In November 1942, he convened a special meeting with leading designers to discuss possible solutions. One proposal was the development of submarines using the Walter gas turbine, which could provide an underwater speed of up to 25 knots for six, seven hours. However, mass production of such submarines under wartime conditions was impossible. As an alternative, designers Bregging and Schurer proposed maximizing the number of batteries and using a snorkel to recharge while submerged. This idea became the foundation for a revolutionary project that would change the rules of submarine warfare forever. The key element of the new design was its powerful electric motors. While Type 9 submarines had electric motors rated at 1,000 horsepower, the Type Dexioxine's combined power reached 4,200 horsepower. This allowed for an underwater speed of up to 17.5 knots for two hours, or an economical speed of five knots for 60 hours. Such speed and endurance made it possible to overtake enemy convoys and effectively evade pursuit by escort ships. A revolutionary feature was the battery installation, weighing a total of 225 tons. 14% of the submarine's submerged displacement of 1,600 tons. The number of battery cell groups was tripled compared to the Type 9, and the cells themselves were made with thinner plates, which increased capacity but reduced their service life to about one and a half years. Compactness was achieved thanks to the unique figure eight-shaped pressure hull. The battery compartments occupied one-third of the hull's length and were arranged in two tiers with a central passage between them. This design allowed for a massive number of batteries to be installed while maintaining efficient hydrodynamics. The submarine had a short, high hull with a streamlined sail reminiscent of modern nuclear submarines. The absence of deck artillery reduced water resistance, contributing to higher underwater speeds. Remarkably, the vessel could travel faster submerged than on the surface, a true breakthrough for the mid-20th century. Another important innovation was the snorkel, a device that could be raised faster than the periscope and supplied air to the diesel engines while at periscope depth. Charging the batteries without fully surfacing significantly reduced the risk of detection by enemy radar. To further lower radar visibility, both the snorkel and the periscope were given special coatings. Among the key combat advantages was a new fire control system that ensured high accuracy in torpedo attacks. All six torpedo tubes were located in the bow, and the automatic reloading system reduced the time needed to prepare for a new salvo to just a few minutes. With the help of radar, hydrophones, and an echo sounder, the crew could select targets within a convoy and employ acoustic torpedoes that homed in on the sounds of enemy ships. The ability to conduct attacks from depth without surfacing to periscope level significantly reduced the risk of detection. Crew conditions were also drastically improved compared to earlier submarine classes. Instead of the cramped, austere environments found on Type 7 or Type 9 boats, the Type Vix Japan offered relative comfort. Onboard equipment included desalination units, air conditioning, and other amenities, allowing the crew to endure long patrols. The operational range reached nearly 15,000 miles, double that of the Type 7, enabling missions in remote areas of the ocean. However, these impressive features came at a cost. The batteries that provided high speed and extended submerged endurance had a service life of roughly one and a half years. This was a deliberate compromise as the Type Boeing Gwain was designed as a wartime vessel with a short life cycle, much like tanks or aircraft. It was intended for intensive use in combat conditions, where the average operational lifespan of a submarine matched this time frame. This approach made the boat a consumable asset rather than a long service vessel like peacetime warships, which could last for decades. The installation of such a massive battery system posed additional challenges. 
its weight required the innovative figure eight hull design, allowing batteries to be placed in two tiers. While ingenious, this solution complicated both construction and maintenance, adding logistical difficulties during wartime. Despite these compromises, the submarine's combat potential remained unmatched. Herbert Werner, a commander of a Type 7 boat, was convinced that the Type 50 Carni could have ensured crew survival in situations where older models became easy prey for the Allies. These submarines represented a genuine threat, capable of shifting the balance of power in the Atlantic. If only they had been deployed in time, the revolutionary features of the Type Von Quinten submarines had almost no effect on the course of the Second World War due to critical production delays. The project, completed in June 1943, proved to be extremely ambitious and resource-intensive, which, under wartime conditions, created insurmountable obstacles. Continuous Allied bombings of German shipyards and industrial centers drastically slowed construction. The first electric submarine of the type von Quinz entered service only in April 1945, when Germany was on the verge of surrender. During 1944-1945, the Kriegsmarine received 121 such boats, but only one, U-2511, ever went on an operational patrol, departing its base on 30 April 1945. That patrol became a striking symbol of lost potential. On 4 May 1945, U-2511 sighted the British cruiser Norfolk and had every opportunity for a successful attack but the commander refrained, fully aware of the hopelessness of the situation. The problem was compounded by strict training requirements. After construction, each submarine underwent three months of trials, followed by a six-month combat training course. Even in the final months of the war, these regulations remained unchanged, critically delaying the boat's deployment. This approach effectively neutralized the potential of the new submarines. Had Germany been able to deploy even 50 Type V submarines in the Atlantic by mid-1943, the course of the war could have changed drastically. With their speed, diving depth, and ability to attack from underwater, these vessels could have inflicted catastrophic losses on Allied naval forces. According to some experts, they might have driven the Allies out of the North Atlantic, kept Italy under Hitler's control, and even made the opening of a second front impossible. Some historians believe that if Germany had simultaneously produced around a thousand Tiger tanks of both variants, the war's outcome might have been entirely different. In reality, however, Germany could secure neither that number of tanks nor a sufficient number of Type Veni Ein submarines. The crisis of the German submarine fleet became inevitable due to the rapid improvement of Allied anti-submarine forces. By 1945, they had numerous destroyers and new classes of warships equipped with radar and a head-throwing weapons, which allowed them to attack submarines without direct contact. Escort carriers provided reliable convoy protection, with their aircraft armed with depth charges and homing torpedoes. Four engine bombers such as the B-17 and B-24, as well as heavy flying boats equipped with radar and searchlights, patrolled the Atlantic continuously, turning it into a deadly trap for German submariners. Despite their limited influence on the Second World War, the Type Venipline submarines left a significant mark on the history of naval technology. After Germany's surrender in 1945, the Allies gained access to captured submarines and blueprints, a true treasure trove for the post-war development of submarine fleets. The Type von Ewaint boats, regarded as the best of their class at the time, were of particular value. The advanced solutions embodied in these submarines became the foundation for new generations of underwater vessels in various countries, including the Soviet Union, the United States, and the United Kingdom. In the Soviet zone of occupation, the Allies seized completed boats and observed the final stages of construction at German shipyards, allowing Soviet engineers to study the design and technologies in detail. American specialists analyzing these submarines noted that as of May 1945, anti-submarine forces had no effective means of countering the type von Inkes. Their speed, diving depth, and ability to attack from underwater made them almost undetectable with the technology of the time. 
One of the most striking examples of their influence was the creation of the Soviet Project 613. These diesel-electric submarines, developed from captured examples, became the most numerous type in the Soviet fleet. A total of 215 were built, helping the USSR partially close the gap with Western nations during the 1950s. Although Project 613 was simpler and smaller in size and its diesel engines were more powerful than its electric motors, the external resemblance to the German prototype was unmistakable. These submarines were highly reliable and produced low noise levels, making them effective for patrol and combat missions. The Soviet Union operated captured type Veni Uyn submarines in its fleet and exported Project 613 boats to socialist bloc countries and other states. China, for example, built its own series of 21 submarines by copying the Soviet design. Remarkably, some of these vessels remained in service in certain countries until the end of the 20th century, a testament to their quality and durability. This fact underscores the foresight of the German engineering solutions that inspired the project. Western nations also incorporated German innovations into their own submarine fleets. The streamlined hull design, snorkel, powerful batteries, and other technological advancements became standard features for post-war submarines. 